Discord. Good morning, everybody. I hope you guys are safe. I hope um, you can get the vaccine in the close future and in the near future, actually. And, or if you maybe you have even got your first shot by now. And hopefully we get to see face, each other face to face soon. My name is Dr. Denise, Associate Professor in Small Animal Internal Medicine. And today we'll be talking about ECGs. Um, I wanna walk you through why we use ECGs in the clinic, why it matters, and why ECGs have not changed in the last 100 years. That's true. We have had electrocardiography, which is started with a dog, actually. The first subject to get an ECG recorded was a dog, was from a dog. And for the last 100 years, nothing really changed. So the devices went from 600 pounds of weight to the size of a credit card today. I will show you some examples. But reading and interpreting the ECG remains the same thing. So uh, I know the case of this week does not did not have a trace, which made me like a little disappointed, I'll be honest. I'm just kidding. Uh, but probably in the next cases after the spring break, you will get another case with an ECG. And for sure, we will talk more about ECG traces during year three and year four. So the bottom line that I would like to uh, remind you today, it's that by the end of this session, you will be very confused. ECG is not something that you can learn how to read uh, in an hour and a half. It's practice. It's like learning a new language. If you had the opportunity to try to learn a new language, especially if the writing of the language is different, um, practice what is what makes it perfect. So ECG is the same thing. There are plenty of resources available online. I created a little corner for, our, for ourselves where I post good resources and examples and discussions. And I'm trying to make that a uh, not overwhelming area in terms of content, but have the best resources that can help you. And that is now in, in Atlanta under veterinary cardiology community. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started. I want to hear from you guys. Grab your phones or visit the polav.com forward slash vetmed and type there. What are your main questions so far? Oh, you are almost second year students now. Between your first year of experience in vet school plus your many years of pre-vet experience, you probably have seen ECGs before. So let me know what you think. You can type the question there and you can upvote other people's questions. Nice, thank you very much for participating. I really appreciate you guys' participation. No, makes this much more fun. Instead of just me, a talking head on your screen, this makes like a two-way uh, session. Wow, look at this, 11 votes. 14 votes, I, I guess you guys woke up early today. Thank you very much. How do you read them? What exactly it's telling us? How to recognize abnormalities? How does it work? Normal versus abnormal. What can and can't you diagnose using ECG? Oh my God, these are great questions. What well, interpretation is expected for the general practitioner? Excellent question. Um, what do they read? Can it, uh, and I need to scroll down there. Oh yeah, man, oh, go back here, go, go back here. There are so many good questions here. What is sinus arrhythmia? What do they mean? What is an ECG necessary versus diagnostics? Awesome. You know, some of these questions are so good. I'm actually gonna post them on the Q&A session of the community on their ECGs because these are great questions. And I'll, I'll be able to provide more resources there as well. So how do we read them? I'm gonna go over today. I'm gonna give you resources. I'm gonna give you a stepwise and I'm gonna give you for free a damn smartphone app. 
So you can use the smartphone app to help read them. What is exactly telling us? I'm going to be sure that we go over that. How to recognize abnormalities? Yes. And what can and can you diagnose with using ECG? Great question. Let's take a look on that. So for you, for my friends who asked, what do you expect? What is expected from a general practitioner? I'll be honest with you. General practitioners should be able to read ECGs. Why? Because ECGs is something that give you, give you, gives you an information about the electricity of the heart immediately. It's like almost free information sitting there. You can get a credit card size uh, device, put on the chest of the dog and get the ECG on your phone and just quickly glimpse over it and get an information. Other example, anesthesia. So you're doing a spay and you're watching the monitor. Something funny start happening there. So that's, that information is very important for you to make sure that you can identify quickly. You, can't, you don't have the time to take a, a picture, run an ECG, send to a cardiologist and wait 24 hours for the report if you're doing anesthesia. You, the general practitioner, is responsible for identifying abnormalities. And because they are very well established and defined, let me just make sure I mute you guys. I thought you could. I checked our credit. Oh, forgot you. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Can you hear me? No. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that happens. Don't worry. Because what was what I was talking? Yeah. Because you, as a general practitioner, you are primarily responsible for that dog or cat laying on the table during a spay. If something bad happens on the ECG, you are responsible for reading that as well. If your RVTs can get trained, perfect. But that's important. That's a good example. Okay. Uh, we, I want to hear more about examples from you guys on my next slide. But for now, this is how we this is how we approach ECGs. You guys are in the bottom here, okay? Year, year one students, you're learning about heart anatomy, electrical physiology. This is important because it builds on, if you understand the heart anatomy, if you understand electrophysiology at the cellular level, then you can understand how the waves of ECG are formed. And then you start learning today how to identify the waves. And then the relationship between the waves, determine the heart rate and rhythm, and the mean electrical axis. So this is what I expect of you from you guys as first years. Now, when you when you move to a second year level, then you have you learn more about um, analyze the wave morphology, identifying the specific arrhythmias, and then by year three we will be talking about specific therapy. Okay, so. What is the take home message here? You're not gonna leave the session today knowing everything. It's impossible. But if you understand that this is a three year, three year journey in learning more about ECGs and you can pace yourself and practice and be proactive, be proactive in looking up uh, content, you will do great. So you guys asked for when we, when we should do an ECG. So I want to hear from you first. What should I ask for an ECG? I gave you some examples. Give me more. Give me more examples of when we should do an ECG. When we have an arrhythmia. Great. What is an arrhythmia? When the heart is not in rhythm. Let's see, arrhythmia on auscultation, excellent. Every time you hear a significant arrhythmia on auscultation, you should run an ECG. It's just a good practice. When we auscultate about abnormalities, oh, good point. So talking about auscultating abnormalities, ECGs do not detect murmurs. Let me repeat that, because that's a very important uh, misunderstanding. If you hear a murmur, Lushed up, lushed up, lushed up. You guys like my beatboxing, don't you? Lushed up. So 
if you hear a murmur, running an ECG will barely add any extra clinical information for your case. If you hear a murmur, the echocardiogram, echocardiogram is by far the best diagnostic tool. And we'll be talking about echoes uh, the week after spring break. Now, if you hear a murmur, you probably gonna do chest reds and echocardiogram. If you hear a regular beat or drop it beat, or for example, post deficits as somebody has entered, then for sure you want to run an ECG. Some other good examples here, before general anesthesia, excellent, because there are some silent, uh, silent ECG abnormalities that do not necessarily cause abnormalities in the auscultation like irregular beats, but they can still be significant. We will talk today about uh, conduction disturbances. Um, during surgical procedure, as we mentioned before, when you hear a murmur, that's actually not the case. So if I were on the phone right now, I would look for when you hear a murmur and I would downvote that because that's not one of the reasons we do that. Okay, we would downvote when you hear a murmur. Before general anesthesia, working up senior animals, absolutely. Monitor depth of anesthesia pain. Monitor depth of anesthesia pain. Wow, that's a great one. Yes, because when the patient is, when the anesthesia is too deep, we sometimes we see decreasing blood pressure, we can see decreasing heart rate. So yes, that's a great one. Hyperkalemia, excellent. Hyperkalemia is a very important life-threatening condition. And one of the ways that we can quickly detect hyperkalemia is actually on ECGs, which is faster than doing a blood, a blood work, in the, even if in the clinic. Mm, great, so thank you very much. So I, did, I didn't really recap here in terms of the things that I normally look for, irregular rhythm, history of collapse, coughing, shocking, trauma, these are all good. I put murmurs here because sometimes they are associated with regular rhythms. Great, so first things first. Uh, over the years, I realized that reading ECGs sounds more complicated than, it, than uh, I believe. So I created a smartphone app and it's called ECGZ. It's not in the Play Store or in the um, Apple Store because it's in eternal beta phase. I, I developed this with the IT from Western University, great people, by the way. And with the help of Tristan Moore, our, I think he's our fourth year student now. And so for that reason, I recommend if you, I recommend you to download it and install it in your, in your phone. You have to visit this uh, link using your smartphone. You might have to accept installing apps from unknown sources. I don't have a, an iOS, I don't have an iPhone, so I don't know exactly how you make that happen on an iPhone. I am very familiar with Android, so you don't download and when you try to open, you just have to go in your settings and accept unknown sources and then you install it. Um, it is too rough on the edges. Okay, uh, it's an eternal learning process. Uh, and, and then we are, I'm trying to expand. Basically, it goes through questions and answers and you answer the questions like, what is the heart rate? What is the rhythm? Is it regular or irregular? Does it look like this? Does it look like that? And I had screenshots of several pictures of my DCGs that I had over the years and guide you through a decision matrix and points to the most likely abnormality. Uh, there are some links, for example, if you don't know how to read the heart rate, there is a link there on the, to a YouTube tutorial. I'm not sure, I need to double check if those YouTube tutorials are working because I re-recorded them recently. So I might, the links might be broken, but the new links are available on Elantra, okay? So this is a free resource for you guys. Uh, I only made this available to our students. Um, if you can read more about the specific arrhythmias, if you have questions, these are, there are summaries for every main arrhythmia from good resources that Tristan and I did. So make sure you check it out and use and abuse it. If you find something that is broken, let me know. Or if something that, that you want to help, this is a community effort. Enjoy it. Now, in terms of the Elantra, let me go back. Let, let me jump to Elantra. 
um, really quick here. Can you guys, um, can you guys see? Oh, I was not monitoring the chat box, sorry. Uh, answering questions from Max. Will lecture slides be available after? Absolutely. Uh, Sarah, how do you find today's lecture slides? Um, I haven't posted them. Let me let me double check. Uh, so if you go to the Elantra website, I'm getting better in making the layout looking good. Can you guys see? Can somebody just type quick in the chat box if you can see the website? Am I sharing the right screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. So um, here you can uh, make sure that you go into document sharing. And also the most recent lectures now I have uploaded them on YouTube and I have posted them here. So the physical exam lecture from Wednesday is already here. The echo lecture from two weeks is already here because this is the last year's recording. And last year I did, I did an MCB on biomarkers. So in case you have learning issues on BNP, this is a good resource as well. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kindy, we're gonna have uh, biomarker, cardiology biomarkers with you guys on MCB. I have posted resources from previous years because second year students are freaking out because we moved from Blackboard to Elantra and they can have access to these resources. So to make sure that helps them as well, I'm posting resources that you still will have, okay? Uh, there are some like KQ cases and some procedures that are, are videos that I recorded. And when you go in document sharing, look for the ECG Learning Center. Let me make this big. Look for the ECG Learning Center. On ECG Learning Center, uh, I will post here today's lecture and the slides. I'm sorry, I didn't prepare the slides. Uh, I didn't prepare the PDF of the slides ahead of time. Uh, but there, there, are very other, there are several other resources that are very similar to my talk. For example, this quick approach we'll be talking soon, okay? So uh, we'll make sure I post the video of today's lecture as well as the slides here for you guys. Would that be okay? So uh, where if, if, you, if you want to download the ACG Easy app, it's also available there and the ACG Learning Center, uh, the link is available there. Okay, we talk about what to do is, what, why we do ECGs. And just to recap, sorry, I need more coffee. Just to recap, ECG is the only tool, only diagnostic tool that we have available in humans and animals where you can identify arrhythmias and confirm arrhythmias in terms of the origin and how they are happening in the heart. There is no other diagnostic tool that you pinpoint an arrhythmia so well at in, and less invasive, let's put it this way, than an ECG. Of course, you can put catheter through the jugular all the way to inside of the heart and then map the heart and, and, uh, and such. There are more invasive techniques that they use in human medicine, especially to pinpoint the location of an arrhythmia. However, fast, simple, uh, painless, and very cost-effective. So I would say after your stethoscope, your thermometer, an ECG is a great investment for your clinic. Given that, how does it work? So many years ago, I was putting the, the electrodes, all those wires, I was clipping the wires in a dog. And I had this very simple lady, uh, the client was in the room with me and I had like 12 wires to, to clip in the, in the dog's uh, skin. And then she looked at me and I was in a hurry. She looked at me like very worried. And, and then I was like, are you gonna shock my dog? And I was like, oh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, it, I can see that. If I just putting a bunch of wires in your dog connected to a computer, it looks like I'm gonna shock him. So I stopped and like, no, I'm sorry. Your, your dog, you're gonna shock my computer. And that's exactly how an ECG works. Imagine the heart as a battery. This is the simple analogy that I like to make. Imagine the heart like a battery. You have the positive pole, you have the negative pole. By definition, by definition, we decided that the apex of the heart is the positive pole and the base is the negative pole. We'll talk more about that. So 
when I run a, when I run an ECG, what I'm doing is detecting the electrical activity of the cardiac cells through this coming through the skin. So, yeah, the dog and the cat will shock my equipment. But the the amount of electricity that comes from the heart in every single heartbeat, it's very, very small. So the, the devices that we have amplify that electricity for us to be able to make a, a recording on the paper. That's it. This is how it works. Now, everything else is just where you put your wires. And we will be talking about that soon. Let's dive deep into the cellular level. So, because if you understand the dance of the ions inside of the heart, you will understand when like hyperkalemia, hypokalemia, hypercalcemia, hypocalcemia, you will be able to understand what happens on the ECG. Going back to MCB 101, membrane channels of all cells in our body. Every single living cell in our body has the ATP, uh, the sodium potassium ATP dependent uh, pump. And because of the eternal function of this pump, what we have outside of the cell, there is a bunch of sodium. And inside of the cell, there is a bunch more of potassium. And this is how the cells are in homeostasis. Now, imagine this line here is the cardiac cell. To the right side of my screen is inside of the cardiac cell and to the outside of is the extracellular medium. As I just said, because we have the ATPase dependent uh, sodium potassium ATPase pump, we have a lot more sodium outside of the cell and a lot more potassium inside of the cell. What makes cardiac cells uh, special is because they have these channels, fast and slow channels that open depending on several factors. And this is not an MCB lecture or BSL lecture. So I, anticipate, I expect you guys to go look, read deeper about, uh, more about how these channels work. But basically, when you have a, a initial stimulation, in this case, coming from the assay node, because the assay node is the pacemaker, it can self-fire in every cardiac cell. By the way, this is very important because of arrhythmias. Every cardiac cell, if it sits for too long, will eventually depolarize. And when this we call intrinsic automaticity. And when the intrinsic automaticity is messed up, you can have early depolarizations firing up here and there. And that's one of the mechanisms of arrhythmias. So going back here, SA node fires, the first channels to open are what? Chat box. What are the fast channels in the cardiac membranes? Sodium channels, yes. So the sodium channels will open first. These are fast sodium channels and they let the sodium enter their cells really, really quick. Then what is the next channel that opens? Is it like a lazy channel? It takes a little bit of time to open. Anyone? Oh. Calcium. Good job, guys. Calcium channels. Calcium channels will let calcium enter, but it takes a little longer. And then now what you see, I have a bunch of sodium channels, sodium uh, and calcium ions inside of the cell. And the last one to open is the potassium channel. So at the end of depolarization, what we have? We have the ions backwards. We have much more potassium outside of the cell and much more sodium and calcium inside of the cell. So the sodium potassium ATPase pump has to work to put everybody back in place, okay? And this calcium here is uh, believed to help the contraction because you know, as you will see, the calcium is what connects to the troponin C uh, to start the actin myosin contraction. But the, for the standpoint of ECG, this is what matters. Sodium, calcium, and potassium are the three most important ions uh, for the cardiac depolarization. 
So now let's take a look on this chart. Um, if you're not familiar with this, this is the action potential, action, uh, action potential of the myocardial cell. This is what makes cardiac cells different from other any um, musculoskeletal cell or even neurons, any cell that depolarizes. So if the cells is at rest here and you have a stimul any stimulus in this cardiac cell, can be electrical or mechanical. If you go there and touch the heart, like physically touch the heart, the, the cells will contract. So the first thing happens that the fast sodium, sodium channels, the fast sodium channels let a lot of sodium enter and the, actual, and the uh, potential difference, differential of the myocardial cell goes way positive because we have a lot of positive ions entering the cell. So it goes from like minus 90 all the way to above plus 40 in terms of millivolts of actual potential across the cell membrane. Now, there is a little bit of potassium that leaks right in the beginning. That's why we have always have this little dip, okay? But that's not that much, enough to make this, the actual potassium go back to negative. Because right after the sodium, these low calcium channels keep entering positive ions, pushing positive ions inside of the cell. And, and then that's where you have the plateau. The plateau is particularly important because it delays the repolarization phase. And in, during the repolarization, we have the potassium ions leaving the cell, now in a much larger concentration, which forces the cell to go back to a negative uh, actual pot uh, potential differential of the membrane, where the sodium potassium ATP is pumped will work hard, okay? So in a nutshell, these are, this is how every, every uh, cell depolarizes. But guess what? What you're seeing here, it's pretty much an ECG. We have the depolarization and the repolarization. So the QRS is the beginning of the, the first phase here, the phase uh, one. And then it goes back during a repolarization phase. We will see later. Now, an important aspect of the depolarization of the cardiac cell, it's that when the cardiac cell is fully depolarized, it cannot depolarize again. Duh. If the cell is fully depolarized, of course it cannot depolarize again. But why I'm wasting, what I'm wasting my time and your time on this? It's not a waste, it's an investment. Because when the cell is going through its uh, repolarization phase, which is this one, depending on the intensity of the stimulation, the cell can fire again. But this is a bad firing. It's the cell is not ready. So I'm saying it's like you just woke up and you realize you're late for Dr. Denise talk on ECGs. You haven't had a, your coffee. You you pop up Zoom. You keep your 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 camera off because you are a mess. And you, now you have to hear about depolarizations and extra potential. Oh my God, I am absolutely refractory. But then. After some coffee, after some time, you might be in the re relative refractory. You can start listening to something, but you're not like fully awake. Okay? So in this situation, if this cell is stimulated during the refractory period, during the relative refractory period, bad things happen. This is a second mechanism of arrhythmias. And these are the deadliest ones. So if a cell is stimulated during the relative refractory period, it is predisposed to have early after depolarizations, which is a mechanism of arrhythmias, okay? Questions, of, questions so far? Any questions about the cellular mechanisms of the ECG? Are we good? Wait, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm writing frantically. So I want to make sure I got this right. So during the absolute refractory period, we cannot re-stimulate the cell, but during the relative refractory period, if we do happen to re-stimulate the cell, that's bad. Yes, that's a good point. Thank you, Cecilia. Yes. During the relative refractory period, if you stimulate the cell, the cell can fire again, but you're not going to fire normally. You're going to fire like in a weird slope. I don't have a drawing here, but basically if I would if I were to draw something, you'll be something like this. If you stimulate the cell right here, let's suppose you stimulate right here, 
then the cell you will fire again, but in a in like a weird slope. And then the problem that it, it can self perpetuate, and it, and it can start doing this is self perpetuates, which causes fibrillation of the tissue and then death. That's why it's so risky. So when you start reading more about um, mechanisms of arrhythmias, there are three or four, depending on how where you read mechanisms of arrhythmias. One of them, it's called the early after depolarizations. But before we go into arrhythmias, I want to make sure uh, we understand how the ECG it is uh, collected, is captured. Thank you for your question. Um, next. So now, this is a my one slide that explains how we collect it, how we record ECG in a piece of paper. Okay, so. Sip, get a sip of your coffee, buckle up because if, uh, if you get this one, you get everything else, okay? Stay with me. So let's imagine here we have a, uh, let me change my marker for laser pointer. Here we have a myocardial fiber. And you remember from histology, these are not round cells. Th these are elongated cells. They look like tubes, they connect like this. They collect like, like this to each other through the gap junctions. So for the purpose of the exercise, this is a myocardial cell. And the myocardial cell is at rest. So there are a lot of sodium outside of the cell and a lot of potassium inside of the cell. As a consequence, I have more positive charges outside of the cell. And I have more negative charges inside of the cell. But I have two electrodes to, dot, to detect the difference in potential. Because so far here, let me go back one just to explain something really quick, like here. How do we detect this, the action potential of the cell? How do we get this drawing? Pretty much you have to do this. You have to get it. If this is the cardiac cell, I'm going to draw. try to draw the cardiac cell here. If this is the cardiac cell, you have to stick an electrode inside of the cell and put another electrode outside of the cell, connect these two to a device. And this device, you tell you if it's positive or negative. And then you have like a dial that will show you if it's positive or negative. So if the electrode is, is stuck inside of the cell and there's a bunch of negative ions inside of the cell, and outside I have a, a bunch of positive ions, then my device, you point to the negative side, the negative pole. Does it make sense? But I have to stick a freaking probe inside of the cardiac cell. This is not what we do in real life. In real life, we just put electrodes touching the skin with alcohol or gel. So for that reason, the ECG, we use two electrodes. Basically, we have two electrodes. And if you've seen any like mo uh, anesthesia monitor, you say, hey, Dr. Denise, I don't understand. The monitors that have worked so far, they have like at least three wires. Yes, because you have the positive, the negative, and the ground. OK? So forget about the ground right now. You have just two, a positive and a negative. And this drawing. I don't have the positive and negative right now, but you're gonna get it. If I have the, go back here. If I have the cardiac cell again at rest and I have a bunch of sodium ions outside and a bunch of potassium inside, now I have a more positive charges outside of the cell and more negative charges inside of the cell. I can't stick a probe inside of the heart. So I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put one electrode in one end of the fiber and one electrode in one another end of the fiber and compare the two. By definition, here's the point. By definition, I decided that my electrode reference is this guy here. So this guy here is the reference. And this is important. The electrode reference is what makes the, the ECG go up or go down. Why? 
if I compare the electrode reference with this electrode right now, this one sees a bunch of positive charges. This one sees a bunch of positive charges. Both are the same. What do I get? On, what, I, what do I get on the paper? I get simply a flat line because there are no differences between the electrode reference versus the other electrode. It's just equal, positive and positive. They are seeing positive charges. So I just got a flat line. Now, once I stimulate the cells, these things, now things are getting interesting. Sodium channels are opening, the fast sodium channels are opening. And then I have a rush of positive charges inside of the cell. And now one, but this depolarization is going from one end of the cardiac cell to the other end of the cardiac cell in this direction. So the depolarization wave, as we call it, is going in this direction here, okay? So as a consequence now, what do I see? I see my electrode reference it still sees a bunch of positive, uh, positive charges, but the other electrode is now seeing negative charges because I define the electrode reference being the one on the right. And I, this one now sees positive charges versus the one that sees negative charges. I have a positive deflection upon the piece of paper. But this is pure by, by, def, by uh, convenience. I define this, the electrode on the right one to be the electrode reference. Now, question so far. Are you with me? Okay. Let's keep going. Now, guess what? The cell is fully depolarized. Now I have a bunch of sodium and calcium ions inside of the cell. And the potassium, I have more negative charges outside of the cell. By definition, my electrode reference is the right one. It sees negative charges compared to the other one that also sees negative charges. So what is the difference in potential here? Zero. Because this is negative is in one versus negatives. So the difference is zero. That's why my wave goes back to a flat line. Even though the cell is fully depolarized, there is no differences in potential. Therefore, I got a flat line. Note that, oops, this situation is the opposite of the, of the first one. The first one, the cell was at rest, not depolarized, but I just get a flat line. Now the cell is fully depolarized and I just get a flat line too, because what the ECG detects is the difference between one electrode and the other. And that's the key to understanding an ECG. It's all about the difference between two wires. When the cell repolarizes, generally speaking, the, the repolarization follows the same direction of the depolarization. So the same way the cells depolarize, the cells repolarize in the same order, generally speaking. So now what we have, we have one side of the, the device detecting more positive charges, but my electrode reference, which has not changed, remains the right one. My electrode reference detects negative, negative charges. So as a consequence now, I have a negative deflection on the piece of paper. Until the cell is fully depolarized and then goes back to the beginning of this. Ta-da! Welcome to the ECG. This is how it works. We have two wires that can detect the difference in potential from one side to the other. Now, the confusion is where you put the wires because the heart is round. The heart is elliptical. So where do you put the wires? I, if I put here, and if I put here, let me just, actually, let me just stop because this, this will be cool to do like this. 
So this is an example of a heart. If I put the if I put one wire here and I put the other wire here, I will be seeing the difference from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart. Now, what if I put one wire here and one wire here? Now we'll be seeing the difference between the atria and the tip of the ventricle. What if I put the wires in diagonal? I will be seeing, I will be seeing the difference in potential from this side of the heart, which is like right atrium to left ventricle and so forth. So the confusion, people get really confused on ECGs. It's because they don't understand where you're putting the damn wires. As long as you understand where their wires go and which one is your electrode of reference. Okay. 99% of the time, we work on lead two. And lead two is right shoulder, which is here, and left leg, which is right here. Why do we use lead two? Because if you look here, if you were to draw the longest axis of this heart, the longest way you can have a straight line in this heart, you go from the top right to the bottom left. So then I put one electrode here in the tip of the heart and one electrode here in the beginning of the right atrium. And this is lead two. This is the one that we normally read because it covers the longest, longest path through the heart. That's it. Are you with me? Good. See, it's not that hard. It's kind of beautiful. It has, it's like poetry. Okay, so now let's take a look on how the recording might change. So remember what I said about lead two? Lead two is the longest angle of the heart. So this will be lead two. We use two in Roman, okay? This is lead two, positive apex of the heart, negative right atrium. This way, if, I, if the electricity of the heart, let's suppose now that the electricity of the heart in this heart, it's normal. It's coming from the SA node. Let's put the SA node right here. And it's going cell by cell this way, like a wave on the surface of a lake. If the electricity is going in the normal direction, it's going towards my electrode reference. Imagine the electrode reference like a big giant eyeball. Okay. I know it sounds silly, but it will help you. If the electricity of the heart, it's going towards the electrode reference. In other words, it's going towards your point of view. You get a positive deflection on the ECG. Very strong positive deflection. On the contrary, if for some reason I have an ectopic site in the right, in the left ventricle. And now the depolarization goes backwards cell by cell because something bad is happening in that heart. This is not normal. I still, I'm still using the lead two as my point of view, my electrode reference. So I'm still watching from here. So as a consequence now, the depolarization wave, it's moving away from my, point of view, my editor, the reference. So because of that, the depolarization is strongly negative. The markings on the paper are strongly negative. Still with me? Give me some hand signs. I know you're busy writing. Yeah. Now, what happens? If for some reason, now let's suppose this is a boxer and boxers like to have the arrhythmogenic right ventricle boxer cardiomyopathy, which pretty much 
they have arrhythmias coming from the right ventricle right here. This is the right ventricle. Oh man, I hate when that's horizontal lines happen. They were behaving so far. Let's try again, right here. Okay, so now the depolarization is going cell by cell in this angle. But I am still watching from my electrode the reference. I have not changed my electrode the reference. Remains in the ape in the tip of the left atrium. Oh, sorry, left ventricle. So now the depolarization wave is perpendicular to my angle of view. So what do I get? Get you get a blip on the radar. Sometimes the same amount as neg positive is negative. We call iso electric. You get an isoelectric depolarization. It's not positive, it's not negative, it's halfway through. If you see an isoelectric depolarization, it means that you're 90 degrees from the real angle. And anything in between. Are you with me? Am I going too slow? Um, so, can you repeat yes the can you repeat the blue arrow is indicating the direction of the action potential or is it the blood flow oh excellent question thank you so much Bridget okay this is very important write that down because I don't have a slide for that when we talk about electricity of the heart we are not talking about blood flow anymore forget about blood flow we are talking about the electricity that is jumping from one cell to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. Remember that the heart, the muscle of the heart is a simsicium. In other words, one cell fires, it spreads to the cells surround it, surrounding it. And those cells depolarize, spread to the next ones. And those cells depolarize, spread to the next one. So as if you throw a, uh, stone on a lake what you get if this cell here fire the cells around you will fire then the next ones will fire then the next ones will fire and so forth it creates this wave of electricity or wave of depolarization and what do we the blue arrows here what the blue arrows mean and let's suppose in this example let's suppose this is the limit of the heart so the waves cannot go further they can only go between the, the black line and the bottom of the screen. So if you go back to college uh, physics and remember vectors, the final vector is the blue line. So all you're seeing here, the blue lines, the blue lines are the final vector of the depolarization wave. Um, there's a question on the chat box from Max. I'm trying to relate this slide to the previous slide. The electrode reference is positive. Yes, perfect, thank you very much. By definition, we decided that the electrode reference is always the positive one. So now on, every time you see a drawing of, of the heart on the ECG, if you see the positive electrode, that's the electrode reference. Who made a decision? Not me, don't blame me. Probably it was Aethoven, the guy who invented this 100 years ago. Are we good? Ask all your questions right now. Anything else that I can that I can help with this concept? Thank you, guys. Next slide. Okay. Now there is a little complication in terms of the conduction of the heart. Is that here I show you the waves as if they go cell by cell all the way from the assay node to the apex of the heart. But we learn in anatomy, there is the slow conduction, which is cell by cell, and there is the fast conduction through the conduction system of the heart. Think like this. Uh, can you go from here to LA on surface streets and never get into a freeway? If you are in Pomona, if you're in the Inland Empire, can you get all the way to LA and never hop into a freeway? Probably yes. How long are you going to take? Hours. Now, 
if you ju if you jump into the freeway and during the pandemic the freeway is not as crowded as before chances are you'll be able to reach LA downtown faster the heart is the same you can the electricity can go cell by cell like I, I described it earlier here can go cell by cell but it's a slow process compared to the conduction system of the heart which is a pretty much a freeway for the electricity to reach farther into the mirror into the heart around or across the heart okay so let's see how much you guys remember of the conduction system of the heart if any so grab your phone and rank the options you have to you have to touch hold and move them up and down for you to see how they are how they are ordered let me see okay if it's moving is it's, it's working Okay, let's take a look. First one, no brainer, top of the right atrium is the SA node. Second is, is in the between the atria and the ventricles, right in the middle of the heart. So that is the AV node, atrioventricular node. Third is the little piece of conduction system leaving the AV node is the bundle of his. Now, bundle of his splits into the right bundle that serves the right ventricle and the left bundle. So four is left bundle. But fifth, it's not right bundle because the, and this is important, the, as you can see, the left ventricle has more number of cells, more cardiac mass. It's just bigger than the right ventricle. So if you have more muscle, you have you need more nerves think like that so the left bundle splits in the anterior fascicle and the posterior fascicle so the number five here is the anterior fascicle of the left bundle and number six is the posterior fascicle of the left bundle because they will take the electricity from the av node and deliver to the uh, left ventricle cells through the Purkinje fibers. So number seven here is Purkinje fibers. And number eight is the right bundle that's, that serves the right ventricle. Okay. So why it's important to understand the conduction system of the heart? This is not just like anatomical details, footnotes that we only ask to mess with you guys and you're never gonna use as a clinician. As I told you last Wednesday, I, had, I made a promise that I only bring content that is clinically relevant, that you will see cases in your professional life when one of these things are messed, messed up. So can I have disease of the SA node? Yes, sick sinus syndrome. Sick sinus syndrome is when the SA node is sick. Can I have diseases of the AV node? Yeah, AV blocks. Can I have diseases of the conduction system of the heart? Yes, we can have blocks. So for example, you have a left bundle block and the ACG looks weird. The right bundle block and the ACG looks really weird, upside down. You can have a left anterior fascicle block, especially common in cats, and that the ACG looks upside down. So understanding the conduction system of the heart helps you understand when the ACG goes crazy. And for example, conduction systems such as left bundle block, right bundle block, left anterior fascicular block, they don't cause arrhythmias. The rhythm is the same. The auscultation is the same. There is no murmurs. There is no arrhythmia. But the ECG is upside down. When you run an ECG and, there's, and then you put in the monitor for anesthesia, the thing is totally upside down and you'll be freaking out. So that's why it's important to understand anatomy. So you can build on that, on your knowledge. Thank you, guys.
let's talk about the Purkinje system now. So we we deliver the electricity from the SNO to the oh, sorry, from the AV node to the conduction system at the heart, and it splits in the right, splits in the left, and the left splits again, and then it reaches the Purkinje system. So what is the Purkinje system? It's the exit ramp from the freeway. You eventually have to get you to go to your house. So you have to leave the freeway. So you take the exit ramp. Now, the Purkinje system the, uh, varies according to the size of the heart. So dogs, cats, and for some reason, humans have a very uh, simple Purkinje system that runs under the endocardium versus horses and cattle have a very robust and developed Purkinje system that goes all the way to the epicardium. And this has a very interesting result. And by the way, you're not gonna find this resource easily. Uh, this is the only slide that I, well, only um, diagram that I was able to find. Uh, the consequence of this is that ECGs of dogs, cats, and humans look like this. You have the P wave, which P wave means uh, atrial depolarization. So, but now let's talk about the ventricles. You have little negative, followed by strong positive, little negative, and then the T wave. Why? Because the electricity comes from the, comes from the SA node to the AV node, and then goes so and goes through the conduction system of the heart, and then goes to the left bundle, and goes to the Purkinje fibers, and then when it reaches here, it goes cell by cell in this direction. See, it goes cell by cell in this direction. What is the final vector here? When we are talking about vectors, the final vector is in this direction. If my electrode reference is here. Remember, the electrode reference for Li Chu is in the apex of the heart. I will see what? A positive or negative deflection? If it's going from inside of the heart, endocardium to the epicardium. If it's going in this direction towards my eyeball, do I get a positive or negative deflection on the ECG? Positive, see? I got a positive deflection, great job. So this is why the ECG of dogs, cats, and humans look like this. You have a positive deflection. Now, horses and cows are funny because the electricity goes cell by cell from the AV node, AV node conduction system. And then again, left bundle, I'm just giving an example here, and then goes to the Purkinje system and goes all the way to the epicardium. And when it reaches the epicardium, it's then delivered to the to the myocardial cells, and then the, the wave will be this way, cell by cell from outside in. So as a consequence, the final vector is actually backwards. But if I put my electrode to the reference in the same place, because I want to compare ECGs of dogs and, cow and cows, how will the ECG of a cow look like or a horse? I have the same P wave, the P wave not, doesn't change because P wave is atria, but now I am gonna have a negative deflection first. Oops, I am not gonna settle for not perfect ECG here. So P wave followed by a negative deflection and then a positive T wave. I could do better. Third time is a charm. Oh. Mm -hmm. So I have positive P wave, negative QRS, and then positive T wave. Okay. So because of the simple fact that the Purkinje system in horses and cows are different, the ECG, the main wave, which is the QRS complex, uh, looks upside down. But that's absolutely normal. I have a couple questions. Yes. Um, uh, the first one, you said that, um, I, I don't know if I missed it, but the QRS complex, it starts by like, having like a little dip of negative. Why does it do that? Great question. So now um, the fact that we have a little divot 
I have a slide for that right in the future, but okay. Just to just to uh, since we are here and I have the anim I have the I can draw it really quick. What happens that when you reach the left bundle, there is a tiny little exit here, really really tiny, that causes the depolarization of the septum, and the septum depolarizes in this way, from left to right. So as a consequence, the very first wave on ECGs, it's a tiny little deflection in this direction and this this the septum it's away from your relative to the reference see it's not going towards the relative to the reference so that's why you see the q wave right here so the q wave it's associated with how thick is the septum or uh is just the initial depolarization of the ventricles which is starts in the septum uh if you see a very deep q wave sometimes it's because the septum is thick or because the right side of the heart is too big but that's a detail, okay? Uh, sometimes you see Q waves, sometimes you don't see Q waves. Some ECGs don't even have the Q wave and it's absolutely normal. Awesome, thank you. And the other question was, would you change your reference point um, for horses and cattle to make them look the same as the e EKG or would you just read them like that? That's a good question, yeah. Uh, is, is EKG systems for horses and cows, we don't use the four leads. We use just two leads for the most time, depending on the system you use. and. And because, because in dogs, we put where? We put in the elbow and in the stifle. But the elbow and stifle horses are so far that the wires don't reach. So then it's our cows too. So the simple way we can do, we call, we call base apex. We put one here in the, on, the, on the top of the chest and one on the xiphoid. But you still use, the, use so you, we end up putting, instead, instead of putting one here and here, like we do in dogs and cats, they do one here and one here, base apex system. Uh, it's just for, it's convenient to put the electrodes that, that way. Uh, and, but the ECG still looks that. So you have to practice yourself to read ECGs of uh, horses and cows uh, this way, where the QRS complex is upside down, that is normal. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. So now let's talk about recording this on a piece of paper. How does this look on a piece of paper? Okay, I have a little animation to show you here. SN node is the pacemaker, fires, the electricity is captured by the AV node, and then it's distributed through the heart, through the fast conduction system of the heart. If I use my electrodes in the normal lead two angle, which is the longest angle, the longest angle of the heart, what do I, and I define, remember, I define the electrode reference being the positive one, this is by definition. What do I get? The first wave we call P wave starts on the right atrium and spreads across all the, the two atria. So let me draw the waves here. So it starts here and it goes cell by cell like this and then continues because this is not blood flow, this is the electricity. It goes through the interceptor, uh, inter interatrial septum and, and reaches all the way to the left oracle, which is from somewhere in the very far uh, left of the left atrium here. Okay. So this is how I have a depolarization of the atria. What is the final vector here? It's somewhere here. Would you agree? This is going towards on my electrode the reference. And because it's going towards my electrode the reference, I get to see a positive spike. If it goes towards the electrode the reference, I get to see a positive spike. But not too big, a tiny one. Why it's not big? Because the amplitude, the amplitude of the waves directly correlate of how many cells you have firing together. So if you look on the, on, the, on the anatomy of this heart, which chambers have more cells, the atria or the ventricles? The ventricles, thank you, Shane. The ventricles are thick, muscle, muscular. They have a lot of cells. When they fire, they send a strong electrical signal. 
Now, atria is really thin. And when you resume going to, a, to the anatomy lab, I beg you to grab a heart and try to, try to see the thickness of the atria compared to the ventricles. Atria is really thin, really thin. This, this drawing doesn't represent the th how thin is the atria. So because the atria is the most, there's not too many cells, we have a small peak. And the peak is positive because it goes in the direction of my electrode reference. Now, the next step is when nothing and everything is happening. It's, it's funny. Bear with me. So the next step is when the AV node captures the electricity from the SA node. But the AV node has one reason to exist. It captures the electricity from the SA node, holds on it for 80 milliseconds, 60, 80 to 100 milliseconds, and then shoots it to the ventricles, to the, to the bundle of his. Comes back and just waits for the new one. Waits for a new depolization, grabs it, hold on it, 100 milliseconds, send it to the bundle of his. And that's it. And why you, me, dogs, cats, horses, every mammal has AV node? Because you need that little delay for the atria to kick and top off the ventricles. If we did not have AV nodes, the heart would work like this. You'd be very inefficient because you need atria kicking first and then ventricle kicking. Like, lap, 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 lap. The only reason the atrium and ventricles don't kick at the same time is because of the AV node. So when the AV node is doing its job, which delaying the depolarization for a few milliseconds, what we see on the ECG, nothing. So what we see on the ECG, it's a flat line, this flat line right here. So the beginning of the P wave to the end of the Q of the QRS, we call the PR interval. And the PR interval is important because when we, we look into the PR interval to identify AV problems. So if you have AV blocks, your PR interval will be longer. Okay, so it's funny because like, it seems that nothing's happening here, but the AV node is pretty busy working on that depolarization. It kind of looks like a maze. It, it has a slow conduction inside of the node and goes makes the electricity go slow before it hits the Band of his. Questions so far? Are we good? So next, Oops, oh, go sorry. ahead. Yeah. Sure, I was please. gonna say, so I know you mentioned that the, the Q is a slight negative dip. So when, when the um, AV node is holding on to that charge, how do we get the negative, the slight negative? Great, so the, the PR interval, oh, this is such a great question. You guys are great. Yeah, the force is strong in this group. So um, there is a mistake on the definition that I forgot to mention, which is there, we call PR interval, but it should be called PQ interval. For some reason, blame Beethoven again, don't blame me. The, the PR interval beginning begins on the uh, beginning of the P, the P wave and ends before the Q, the Q wave. So we haven't reached the Q wave yet. So it should be called PQ. So I'm gonna make in quotes here, P, beginning of P to beginning of Q. But by definition, we name it PR. I guess because some messages like this might not have a Q wave, or oh, this one has a tiny little one, but some ECGs might not even have a Q wave. Okay, this is how we measure the PR interval. Got Again, it. the Q wave, just to, to answer your question, just to recap that the Q wave happens sometimes when we have a little branch here, a little branch from the left ventricle that delivers the depolarization into the muscle. And now you have a depolarization cell by cell in, inside of the, the septum. And that final vector, it's not in the same direction. The vector is this direction, not in the direction of the electrode reference. So my electrode reference here 
you will see that wave moving away as a negative wave, but it's such a small amount of cells that makes a tiny little marking. This normally is like no more than, uh, no more than five uh, little boxes here. Any, any questions so far before we get to the, to the big party of the QRS? So then the electricity goes cell by cell and finally reaches the Purkinje cells and fires from the endocardium to the epicardium in dogs, cats, and humans. So that's the massive explosion of depolarization through the, through the ventricular cells, right and left ventricles. That makes a very strong positive uh, marking on the paper. We call it QRS. Now, let me, let me explain something important. Cardiologists love to confuse things, making things complicated just to protect their turf, I guess. So don't waste your time trying to split between Q, R, and S. Be just call it Q, R, S complex. It doesn't matter if it has a big Q or a small R, a big S, just call it Q, R, S. You save you a lot of headache. If you're reading from human literature and you start seeing descriptions such as like small Q, big R, like Q, Q, uh, double Q, no, forget it. Just read from vet literature on this matter because ECGs in humans are much more complex than in vet medicine. And we don't have to make this complicated because it's already complicated by itself. But the QRS complex of a normal dog, cat, and human looks like this, but it can look anything between a strong positive R wave to a strong negative, okay? Just call it QRS. And if you have a negative wave, don't call it negative R because R by definition must be positive. Just call it inverted QRS. Save yourself from headaches. Deal? Now, everything that depolarizes, repolarizes. So consequently, we will have the T wave is the repolarization of the ventricles. Hey, Dr. Denise, where is the repolarization of the atria? Because every cell that depolarizes, repolarizes. So the repolarization of the P wave, which is the atria, it's somewhere under the QRS. They happen at the same time. The atria is repolarizing while the ventricles is contracting. The heart can have multiple things happen at the same time. So we are never going to see the repolarization of the atria. We only see the repolarization of the ventricles. And we, by definition, call it T wave. Dr. Denise, why do why they start with the letter P? P, Q, R, S, T. Why not A, B, C, D, E? Great question. Actually, the first ECG, the first device, the galvanometer, was, was designed by a different in inventor. And then he used the letters A, B, C, D. Now, Eithoven created a more uh, efficient and portable system. So then to compete with the other guy, he decided to start with the letter P, okay? So there is no fancy definition why letter P. It's just arbitrary. Does the uh, repolarization of the atria, does that just add to the intensity of the QRS or is it just not shown? Not necessarily because it's such a small, it's such a small wave, see here, this, this, take a look on the amplitude. Let, let me show you here. Take a look on the amplitude of the QRS complex, complex and then the amplitude of the T wave. See, the T wave is, is much smaller than the, the QRS. Imagine the T wave of uh, the repolarization of the P wave. It would be really tiny. So it probably adds something, but it's such a minuscule uh, effect that we, we pretty much disregard it. But that's an excellent question. Okay, so by convention, we can have the, uh, okay, back on my time, before there were computers doing ECGs for us, everything was recorded in a piece of paper, a thermal paper. And the paper would just like get out of the machine and we could select the paper speed. So we keep, we keep using the, the definition paper speed. And the paper speeds that we use in small animal medicine is 25 millimeters, 25 millimeters of paper in one second, or 50 millimeters of paper in one second. 50 millimeters, you have a long string of paper in few, in few, in few seconds. 
these are definitions that we continue to use to this day, despite the, the CGs are computer-based now, okay? So then uh, the little square that you see here, the tiny little square on the very bottom, this tiny little square right here, it's presented in this corner here, is the time versus speed, which is the number of seconds that it takes for the ECG to run and the amplitude in millivolts. We'll be talking about that when we calculate the heart rate. Before we move, there is, is there any question about how we record what the correlation between the waves and which chamber is being uh, depolarized? This, um, oh, so let me just clarify. This is a first year uh, learning issue. We expect you to know by the end of this block. Okay, um, I have a question about T wave. Sure. Uh, I, so that is the repolarization uh, of ventricles. So I thought the repolarization uh, process is just a reverse polarization uh, uh, process. So why is has the same direction of the QRS complex? That's an excellent question. Remember, this is uh, the the most the ventricles are not a single cell. They are made of millions and millions of cells that connect each other through the gap junctions. So when one cell repolarizes, the other cell will repolarize because it's in the order they were depolarized. So if the depolarization goes in this direction, for example, if the depolarization goes in this case from uh, because of the Purkinje system that we discussed today, if the depolarizations go from subendocardial to subepicardial, so in this, this is direct, this is the direction of depolarization the cells take, they need time to repolarize. Remember, based on the actual potential of the cell, the cell goes up, then you have the plateau, and then they repolarize. The repolarization is this phase right here. So the cells need that time because of the calcium channels, the slow calcium channels, before they repolarize. So the first cells to repolarize will be inside of the endocardium. Uh, or under the endocardium, and the last cells to depolarize will be the very tip of the tip of the heart under the epicardium. So they have the same uh, vector. They have the same vector of repolarization as the vector of depolarization. That's why the T wave here is positive. Does it make uh, sense? But it um, it has, I mean, it has a opposite uh, flow of charges so I think uh that's yes that's a that's actually a great point yeah it does have the opposite flow of charges and to make things a little more complicated in vet in veterinary medicine the t wave can be positive negative or biphasic so i have had these great discussions with cardiologists why the t waves are positive or can be negative and there is no clear answer I have looked into the human literature. I have looked in the Bibles of uh, electrophysiology in humans. In animals, in that animal, we can have a positive T wave or a negative T wave. It does not matter. So I'll be very honest with you. I gave up understanding the polarity of the T wave. And I no longer use that because no one in vet medicine cardiology looks into the polarity of the T wave. We look on the size of the T wave. If the T wave is really, really big, then there is associated with clinical problems. In human beings, if you go to a human hospital and you go there with a negative T wave and chest pain, they will diagnose you with, myocardial, uh, with a heart attack because a negative T wave in humans is associated with cause, one of the causes is heart attack. But dogs, cats don't have the same thing. Dogs, cats can have a negative T wave and just be fine. So before we launch into this big, ginormous rabbit hole in vet cardiology, I, I ask you all, don't waste your time in trying to understand the T-wave uh, polarity. If it's positive, fine. If it's negative, it's fine. If it starts positive, if it starts negative and then goes positive, we call it biphasic. It's also normal. Thank you, Tao, for your question. It's an excellent question and congratulations. You got a question that I have no answer. Thank you. I am sorry, that's the reality. So somebody, Kelly asked about to explain more about the horse QRS waves are inverted. I will have to go back to that later, otherwise I'll not be able to finish though, is that okay? 
Um, this, this session is being recorded. I will appreciate if you could go back and visit that slide. And if you still have problems, just, just uh, email me, please. Okay, thank you. Now let's talk about positioning of the patient. Uh, can I do an ECG on the patient's on the dog or cat standing? Yes, you can. Laying down on the right, sure. Laying down on the left, sure. On the client's lap, absolutely. However, if you want to do precise measurements, there is a perfect positioning that we call the standardized position, okay? Here's the perfect position of a dog doing an, on an ECG. You'll be laying down on the right side down, so right uh, recumbency, and the elbows and the knees or stifle, whatever you prefer to call, they should be, the back, the back is flat. See the hand here is helping make the, uh, the back flat. And the legs are 90 degrees compared to the spine, making into like a rectangle and making into a box. And the electrodes should be located as near as you can from the elbows and the, style and the knees, as long as you find a skin folder, a skin fold that you can clip. Because if you try it right on top of the knee, sometimes there is no skin enough for you to clip. So you can do a little inwards, a little higher, but do not follow bad techniques that you probably have seen before, putting the electrodes way too close to the skin or way too close to the flank, uh, to the chest here on the armpit. These are not good locations, okay? These locations, uh, they tend to, they, when the dog is breathing or the cat is breathing, <sighs> the electrodes keep moving, for, uh, moving from each other and then causes a lot of artifacts. So as a first year student, you expected to understand the best positioning of this patient. Uh, other things important, like, can I put the dog on, on top of a metal surface? Yes, you can. If you have a rubber mat, like, in cardiology services, you might see them putting a rubber mat to separating the dog from the metal table just to get less artifacts. Now, there's no problem for you restraining the animal while doing the ECG. Your, the electricity of your heart, you're not gonna go through the skin all the way to the electrode. So we're not gonna detect your ECG on top of the dog's ECG. Uh, in terms of the colors that we use, I'll, I'll get to you, uh, Ali, in a second. In terms of the colors that we use, be careful because if you decide to go abroad, you're gonna get very confused. The US uses a different color system of ECGs compared to Europe and South America. So in the US, we use uh, the white on the right. So the white lead, the white clip goes on the right elbow. And then there are these acronyms that you can sing and memorize. Uh, Pretty much the black is on top of the white, the green is in the back, and the red is in the left high limb. So we can say snow, which is the white, and grass is green, are always on the ground, which is the right side. Uh, and if you Google, you're going to find other ways. Um, is, is this important to know where to put the electrodes? Is this a first year learning issue? Yes, it is. Why? Because in an emergency, if you put the electrodes in the wrong, in the, the wrong colors, in the wrong elbows, you might end up diagnosing wrong things and treat the dog incorrectly, dog or cat incorrectly. So it, uh, ignore these ignore this leads for now. These are precordial leads right in the middle. So just ignore these guys here for now. We will talk about them later today. Now let's talk about the cardiac system. Um, cardiac system, it's simply when we start moving wires because you know uh, the first physiologist who start playing with the ECG decided, ah, two wires is way too simple. I want to start moving my wires and see what happens. So this, the, the, as I told you, you pretty much have two wires plus the, plus the ground. The first, the, uh, the one that we use the most is the lead two. But if it's called lead two, where is lead one? Lead one is from the right shoulder to the left shoulder with the electrode reference being identified by the arrowhead. So here's a little hint. When you see the arrowhead, let me put in blue. When you see the arrowhead, that means this is the positive electrode. And here will be the negative side of the electrode. So the electrode reference is always the positive. 
what does that mean? If this is my heart, and here is my right shoulder, because I don't know if the image is flipped for you guys. And here's my left shoulder. And lead one goes in that direction, right shoulder, left shoulder. If I see a positive depolarization on my lead one, what is the direction of my depolarization? Right to left or left to right? Right to left. Right to left. If the depolarization is going this, if the depolarization is going this direction, I'm going to see a positive spike because it's going toward the electrode reference. If you understand this, you're going to be great for the, for the rest of your career in terms of ECG. Trust me. Now, uh, we can, we would like to look on the, EC, on the heart through a 360 lens. In other words, I like to look from, this is lead one. I'm looking from here. Lead one, right shoulder, left shoulder. Lead two, right shoulder, left leg. But what, but I want you here, I want to see from this side too. What do I do? I can use lead three. So lead three, it's right shoulder, left leg. This is why ECG traces have more than one lead. We have six leads because we can combine leads as well. And then when we combine shoulders with legs, we get an amplified vector of the foot. We call it AVF. Is that it show it will be like head to tail. If I combine other leads, I can have the amplified vector of the right. And finally, the amplified vector of the left. Why do I have so many leads? It's just to confuse first year students and it works beautifully. Now, joke aside, if I have six leads, I can look on the, on the heart from any angle. I can look on this angle, I can look on this angle, this, this. I can have a 360 degree view of the electricity of the heart without opening the dog's chest. And this is why when, if you go to a cardiologist, they run an ECG on you, you have the, the, the paper or the, the record of the ECG has six leads. Lead one, lead two, lead three, AVR, the amplified vector of the right, AVF, amplified vector of the foot, and AVL, the amplified vector of the left, okay? Now, the funny thing is that the six leads can be made with only four wires, three plus the ground. So when we put the wires on the patient, we just put right shoulder, left shoulder, right leg, left leg, and that's it. With those four wires, the, the equipment can calculate the six leads of the heart. And this is the, uh, what we call the lead system of the heart. And then because I can have a 360 degree view of the heart, I can put angles on it. So by definition, we have from zero to plus 90 or zero to minus 90 degrees. And this is how we describe. And the normal range for dogs and cats is listed here. For dogs, it's between, I'm gonna make it green is anywhere between 40, which is somewhere here, to 100. This is the normal range for dogs. And cats, I'm gonna make in uh, purple. It's anything between zero to all the way to 160 degrees. So cats, any angle of the heart pointing to the apex is, is good. And for dogs is in between 40 and 100. Why, do, why does this matter? Because, if the angle of the heart is pointing to the wrong direction, it's kind of compass of, your, of the problem. When we calculate, and you will learn how to calculate the mean, of, mean elect, uh, electrical axis of the heart, if it points to the right, if it's pointing, for example, instead of being between a dog, 40 degrees to 100, if it's pointing somewhere here, oh, is pointing to the right side of the dog because the dog is laying down there, is pointing to the right side of the dog. The problem is in the right side of the heart. Might be heartworm, might be tricuspid valve problems, pulmonic stenosis. 
The problem is in the left side, in the right side, because the mean electrical axis is pointing to the right. If the mean electrical axis is pointing to the left, same thing, there is a problem in the left side, go check it out. So I use it a lot when the ECG looks really weird. When the ECG looks normal, then generally the mean electrical axis is normal. Okay, so I know my, uh, my accent is, is thick on this one, so it's called mean electrical axis of the heart. I'm typing, okay? Is the mean electrical axis of the heart. We're gonna go over that. I have a video just for that. Questions so far? And uh, by the way, Max, I appreciate your asking, okay? I rather prefer you guys to be blunt with me, like, I don't understand the word you were saying, Dr. Denise, can you type? Sure, I can. I don't take it personal. And oh, my Dr. Dinez, I have a question, sorry, real quick. Um, so all of the six uh, probes that we're using, we're making three pairs combined vectors, right? Yeah, we have four wires, but one is the ground. So we only okay. have three and then we combine. So for example, all the ones that start with AV, it's a combination of two versus one. When you, if you read more about ECGs, you see diagrams of that. I did not include it here because of sake of time. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your question. You guys have excellent questions. So the, the, the arrow here points to the normal angle of the heart in dogs, cats, and humans. So the mean electrical axis of the heart should be pointing between lead two and AVF generally. Now, remember those old other leads that were connected to the chest of the dog or the picture that I showed you earlier today and I said, ignore those. Those are the precordial leads. Precordial leads are the leads that go straight on top of the chest. So if you go to the cardiologist, they'll put leads on your arms, on your limb, on your legs, and then they'll put, they'll put a bunch of ones around your chest. These ones we, you, we don't use in general as a general practitioner because the devices don't have the extra wires. But in cardiology services we use is just to, do, uh, to map the heart differently because the, the normal lead system that I just showed you maps the heart in 360 degrees in this angle, like the frontal plane. However, if I want to look on this angle, like front to back of the heart, I have no way to look. So I just have these precordials. I want you, for you guys, it's just for you to know that exists. So if you want, one day you see uh, an ECG of more, more lanes, like RV2, V2, V4, and V10, these are the precordial leads. Uh, they are, there are reference values for them in the ECG textbooks, but it's not a learning issue for a general practitioner, as long as you know they exist. Now, let's talk about standardization. As I told you, back on the day when we used ECGs on paper, we had something called paper speed. Paper speed can be 25 millimeters per second and 50 millimeters per second. And this is important when you're calculating the heart rate. Dr. Denise, why do I need to calculate the heart rate if the computer gives it to me? Fair game. If the computer gives you the ECG, uh, the heart rate, most likely is right. Sometimes it's wrong. I have an example. Uh, so it's important for you to know how to calculate the heart rate uh, by hand, simply because we still have preceptors that run ECGs on paper, not on computers. So that's why the really only reason I teach you, okay? Now, let's go over reading an ECG. So first, I created a stepwise approach, how to read an ECG available on the ECG Learning Center. So please go visit that. It's a two page uh, tutorial that I hope you can use and abuse it. If you have questions, make sure you, you contact me. If you go over those steps, those are the steps that the app asks you to do. So they work in synergy, okay? So the, and I also post in the same place under the same link, the quick approach to ECGs uh, for reading and ECGs. I posted a fillable PDF. The fillable PDF is particularly helpful because guides you through this, the steps that you, you should look into. How to cal uh, the calculate the heart rate, the, the rhythm and the drop downs have the names of the arrhythmias that could possibly happen in different parts of the heart. So those are great learning issues for you to look and read more in for the next three years. Okay. 
And if you go on my app, explanations on those uh, arrhythmias are already there as well. You just have to click and read more about arrhythmias. So I will briefly explain how to calculate the heart rate. Actually, I'm running, I'm running late. I'm gonna skip how to calculate the heart rate because I have a 15 minute tutorial available on the CG Learning Center in several ways how to calculate the heart rate, okay? I, I hope you guys can go and watch and rewatch. And if you have questions, please contact me. Calculating the heart rate on ECG is a first year learning issue. We expect you to know by the end of this block, okay? Now, this next step is defining if the, the rhythm is regular or irregular. So there's no, there is no secret here. Eyeball it. Look on these two traces. Which one is the irregular one? Top or bottom? Bottom. Mm -hmm. So how do we define irregular rhythm? We just compare the distance between our R waves. So this is an R wave. This is an R wave. So this is different from here which is different from here, which is different from here. Now, this one is pretty regular. See, it happens in regular intervals. If you have to measure the distance, you're being way too anal, okay? You should be able to eyeball it to call a regular or irregular. This is very simple, no tricks here. And now I give you some differentials of things that normally are associated with regular. Somebody asked in the beginning, Dr. Denise, what is sinus arrhythmia? Sinus arrhythmia is the normal, irregular, uh, regularly irregular rhythm that happens with the heart when you're breathing. Sinus arrhythmia happens when you, you inspire, you have a deep inspiration, the heart goes faster, simply because the negative pressure in your chest gets more negative. As you inspire, you pull blood more towards the heart and the heart needs to pump faster just to get that heart, that blood moving. When you expire, less blood comes to your heart in the same, same rate. So then heart rate can slow down. This is coordinated by the uh, parasympathetic tone. So a sinus arrhythmia is something normal in dogs, but not normal in cats. Cats are if, if you see a cat with, sinus, with pronounced sinus arrhythmia, most likely there is an underlying respiratory problem. Now we define the rhythm as, uh, if it's irregular, we define it as regularly irregular, like happens in sinus arrhythmia, or irregularly irregular, like in this ECG here, when you can never predict. So I like to call the irregularly irregular, a random, is, a random rhythm. You can never predict the next beat. And that's something you pick on your auscultation. Now, how do I identify the waves? There is a trap. It's a trap. It's a trap. There is a trap on identifying Q, uh, the waves on an ECG. Never, never start with the P wave because sometimes the P wave is not there. Sometimes the P wave is hidden. So first, you look for the QRS because it's the biggest, tallest, or the deepest wave on your trace. Always look for the QRS first. It, if, if depolarizes, repolarizes. So then you look for the T wave next. I'm not gonna settle for less than perfect. So, if it depolarizes, then repolarizes. So look for the T wave second. And by exclusion, whatever is left on your ECG should be P waves. So QRS first, look for the T second, and last should be the P wave. If you follow this, you, you, you avoid the traps. I made a video tutorial also how to identify P waves and T waves, because sometimes they look similar, Sometimes they might be overlapping. Sometimes the P wave is not there. So you can have these three scenarios, P and T waves, P and T waves overlapping or no P waves. And I made a video tutorial just for that. And I recommend you guys to take a look.
is a short and sweet one too. Now, the next step is identifying the origin, origin of the QRS complexes. No secret here again. Take a look on this QRS complex here, just the QRS from here to here. Does look weird to you? Does look like very, very weird? No, looks yeah, pretty normal. So if it's pretty normal, most likely the conduction of the heart is working well. So most likely comes from the atria. But cardiologists are fancy people. We don't say atria. We say above the ventricles. So we say supraventricular. So the word supraventricular is just a fancy, fancy way to say from atria. Somewhere in the atria. That's it. Now, take a look on these QRS complex. This is the QRS and here's the T. This is actually the QRS and here's the T wave. Does it look normal to you? No. So if it looks wide and bizarre, most likely comes from the ventricles. That's it. Why it comes from the ventricles? Because if it comes from the ventricles, it goes cell by cell and it goes backwards from where it's supposed to go. So then it looks upside down and really weird. Simple, I told you, there's no tricks here. Now, if you see the other thing to look, it, it, when you identify the P waves, you want to make sure that you find P waves consistently. If you always find a positive P wave only two, then your rhythm starts with the word sinus. Sinus, rhythm. Sinus, arrhythmia. Sinus, tachycardia. Sinus, bradycardia. If you always find a positive P wave, only two, always you find a positive P wave here, a positive P wave, only two, your rhythm starts with the word sinus. Now, if you don't find a P wave, only two, then you have few differentials to work through. But this is a second to third year level of learning issue. The other step that we ask you is to look on the P waves and compare them to the QRS complexes, okay? So for example, you should be able to find one P wave for every QRS, another P wave for another QRS, another P wave for another QRS. And I recommend you to literally identify them all and make sure there is a one-to-one -one ratio. If you have more P waves than QRS complexes, there is a limited set of differentials that you will be looking for. If you have more QRS complexes than P waves, there is a different list for you to work. And clinicians have this uh, committed to their memories. So with practice, you'll be able to easily pick this, oh, I see more P waves than QRS uh, complexes. So I'm looking to AV problems. Oh, I see more QRS complexes than P waves. I'm looking to ventricular ectopic activity. As first years, you're required, expected to be able to identify the waves and match them, okay? I'm giving you straight talk on what we expect to you because uh, we'll be asking you later. Now, the mean electrical axis is how to calculate the angle that I was talking earlier. And I will have to skip this slide too, but I do have, uh, I'm gonna skip this one because I do have a 15 minute tutorial about the mean electrical axis. Mean electrical axis is not difficult, but for some reason can be confusing. And it's one of the top one questions that I get from students in how to calculate it. So this is one of the first videos that I've made. I probably don't even have gray hair in that one. Um, and I hope it helps you guys. If you have questions, make sure you contact me, okay? But please watch that one first. Sorry for skipping this, but I think we spent quality time in the beginning uh, on, the, on this lecture for you to understand the basic concepts. Uh, as I told you, the mean electrical axis, it's a compass that points towards the problem. If it's shifted to the right, it can be a right bundle branch block or increase in the right ventricle size. 
If it's deviated to the left, can be a left bundle branch block, can be a left anterior fascicular block, or can be an increase in left ventricle. Again, these are just pearls that I'm bringing to you, which is not a first year learning issue, it's more a second year level. Now, how about evaluating the P wave morphology on ECG? Because the P wave can look like small, the P wave can look really tall, the P wave can look really wide, or sometimes the P wave can be negative. It's not a first year level skill that I expect from you guys. So you don't have to bother this about this right now, but I made a video tutorial as well. I have another video tutorial in case you want to watch it about how do I evaluate the P wave morphology. Uh, based on questions, I like when you guys send me your questions because I make more videos based on the questions. Okay, so feel free to contact me or you can have, uh, there is a discussion board on the site. You can post your questions there for everybody to see. I'll be happy to answer. And if there's a good number of them, I will make a video about it. Now, ECG is just a picture of the dog. We can do, we, we can do ECGs for longer than a few minutes. We have in the school, what we call the halter monitor. A halter monitor is a 24 to 48 hour ECG device. It's the size of a smartphone that we call, this is one of my patients in the clinic. And of course needs to be a boxer, an old boxer, of course, is the best friend of cardiologists. So this old boxer had arrhythmias that they would disappear in the clinic, but we want to make sure they are happening at home. So we strap the dog with this device and the device is in a little pocket right here. And we send the dog home for two, for one, 24 to 48 hours. And then later when they come back, we read the data from the SD card. Uh, you can do in cats as well. So this is a cat from one of one, one our uh, students that also had arrhythmias and we strapped the halter monitor on the cat. As you can see the heart rate here, the cat was not happy uh, having that thing strapped on him, uh, on her, but it gave us the information that we need. So the halter monitor is an excellent tool if you can't catch the, the arrhythmia in the clinic, or if you need to monitor how many arrhythmias are happening in 24 hours, which is something that we consider for treatment. Uh, now, in, this, in, in recent years, there are new technologies in making the ECG device smaller and smaller and smaller. Nowadays, there is a freaking band-aid that people, they put in people and they, you detect the ECG for a week, record it for a week, and they just download the data later. I haven't tested that in animals yet. What I tested in three projects is the Cardia. Cardia is a, it's a little device that you literally can glue on the back of your phone and then you can run ECGs on dogs and cats. And I tested this device in summer projects with students and it works well. Uh, when we go back on campus, I'll make sure you guys have hands-on experience using this. Uh, it's an $89 device you can buy, you can, anyone can buy uh, and you can play with it. So I make no money making uh, advertisement for this company. I don't have shares of this company or anything else. I just lo love the device because you can do, you can run ECGs on yourself. You can run ECGs on your friends. You can run ECGs on your pets and you can get to learn it. So if you're interested, just let me know. I will provide you more information. So to wrap this up, what we expect from you guys? We expect you guys to identify the waves. As first year students, we expect you to determine the origin of the QRS complexes, supraventricular or ventricular. We expect you to learn how to calculate the heart rate, to determine the mean electrical axis, but we do not expect you as a first year student to detect specific arrhythmias, okay? And that's why I'm trying to be very crystal clear because it can cause a lot of confusion. Um, it's, 10 to, it's 10 to 10, I brought some uh, poll questions, but I will have to skip them today for because I make sure that you guys are not late for PBL and you have a break because this was this was pretty intense. I am sorry we, we ran out of time. I hope it was helpful and uh, any feedback on this talk will be highly appreciated. I read all the comments you guys gave me last Wednesday um, and thank you so much for giving me feedback. I want to make sure I make this even better every year. It's not an easy topic, but I hope it was digestible. Thank you very much, guys. I see you after the break. <laughs>